Hello and welcome everybody to my talk, Living on the Cheap Edge uh, at Global Leisure Austria. I'd like to welcome everybody. And yeah, today we're going to talk about getting your applications cheap on the edge. Um, we're going to talk about new JavaScript frameworks and also edge computing and the new clouds that are around. Let's see. Let's dive in. First, um, a little bit about me. I'm um, Chief Technical Architect at Porsche Informatik. I developed web apps since 1999, which is quite a while now. Um, that was uh, the year that Internet Explorer 5.0 was launched, I guess. And yeah, you find me on GitHub under DRK uh, and yeah, also on my homepage. I tweet at DRK and I also toot at DRK at Mastodon Social. So yeah, just follow me there if you want to. But now to the topic, cheap web hosting. So what would you think about if you think about cheap web hosting? How are most um, websites hosted nowadays that are cheaply hosted? And the first thing that comes to mind is obviously PHP. I think still most of the web pages on the internet are running PHP. It's working wonderfully. You, it, works on one server, you can have a lot of tenants. It's really, really cheap to host. Usually a typical web page will cost you around 10 euros or dollars per month and including a database and traffic and everything. So this is still the benchmark for cheap hosting. And if you're still into PHP and if your site is not too dynamical on the, on the client, I think PHP is still the best way to host stuff. But what happened? What changed in the last uh, few couple, uh, couple of years? We had two things happen. Um, the one thing that did happen is transitional web applications. Um, that's a term that uh, uh, was coined uh, a few years ago, I think one year ago, um, by the creator of Svelte and um, Rich Harris. And transitional web applications are kind of new JavaScript web applications that are dynamic, but are also focused on the backend. Uh, we will talk a little bit more, but more about that. And the second thing that really happened is uh, there are new edge hosting platforms, serverless platforms that uh, enable really cheap uh, application hosting, nearly as cheap or even cheaper than PHP. So. First, have a look at transitional web applications and the frameworks that uh, support this kind of pattern. Yeah, first, uh, let's talk a little bit about history of JavaScript on the web. Um, when you look back um, to the 90s, um, yeah, there was just one way to develop um, web applications, and that was server-side rendered no JavaScript, actually, because um, until 1994, there was no JavaScript. And after 1994, JavaScript was just put in really sm in small pieces here and there to add stuff. Um, most applications were written in, in, in languages like C or Perl, and um, CGI was the usual thing to, to, to host these applications until 1994. Uh, until PHP launched. PHP was a, a real game changer in this uh, regard because PHP enabled uh, people to develop backend web applications quite easy and um, yeah, and gained massive success in, over the next years. Um, yeah, by the end of, uh, of, of the 90s, uh, Microsoft introduced a new thing called Ajax, uh, asynchronous JavaScript and XML was the first thing. So um, XML HTTP request was introduced into Internet Explorer. And this was the first time you could load stuff interactively on the client um, from the backend without um, changing the page. Um, yeah, this enabled uh, some new application uh, um, stuff that I call dynamic JS plus Ajax. So these applications are have some JavaScript on the client but are still mostly server-side rendered. And on the client, they use some JavaScript and Ajax, this communication where they, there's a request on the, from, from the browser to the backend without refreshing the page, getting some stuff back, usually it was a part of the HTML template um, and replacing um, the HTML in the, in the client. This worked quite well. Um, yeah, you also see some other frameworks mentioned in the timeline, like Java was introduced in 1999, .NET 2002, 
and then Rails 2004, which changed a lot uh, in the in the web application world, and um, also jQuery 2005, which helped a lot with this dynamic JS and AJAX patterns because it supported them. And uh, from 2005 on, jQuery exploded and everybody was using it. And so this was uh, quite a, a good time. But what happened next? Uh, the next thing that uh, happened was single page applications, frameworks first uh, introduced by Backbone. And then other frameworks came like, um, uh, like Angular, JS, and then later also React and other, other frameworks. And th these uh, frameworks enabled uh, an, a completely different uh, pattern where the, you develop the page on the client and everything runs on the client and the, uh, the server is just used to fetch data. Yeah, um, also 2015, uh, there was the Fetch API introduced into the browsers, which enabled to easily easy, fetch stuff easier from the backend, not using XML HTTP request anymore. Until then, this that was the only option. Yeah, and now I say there's the timeline of the transi transitional apps that started around 2020. And yeah, we have a look, um, what is a transitional app now? Yeah, what are transitional apps? They usually HTML first. They go back to the first, to the 90s and see, okay, what is HTML? And just do HTML and CSS and nothing else. Yeah, when done right, these, these pages work without any JavaScript. So you can turn off JavaScript in the browser and they still work. The interactivity is typically done via links and via form posts. So there is no, um, there is no need for JavaScript on the client. But you can sprinkle in JavaScript on the client to get more interaction. The server-side rendering or static set generation is usually used. So the, the whole page is rendered on the server, either on build time, then it's a static site generation, or it is rendered when the user requests it. So it's server-side rendered. We look at the patterns a little bit in interactivity later. Yeah. And the cool thing about these frameworks, they switch automatically to single page application mode as soon as they JavaScript uh, kicks in on the client and then they work like a single page application and fetch stuff from the server and it feels quite snappy to use these pages. Also quite good is uh, you have one code base. So in the old times you would have PHP on the back end and then JavaScript on the front end with jQuery and stuff like that or Ruby on Rails on the back end and JavaScript on the front end. And the idea with these new frameworks is to have one code base, which is JavaScript uh, mostly, we see there's some other options. And server and client code are usually even developed in one file. So you have server and the client code in one file again. You feel a little bit like PHP times. Yeah, and the cool thing is uh, these frameworks do automatic code splitting. So they split the backend code to the backend and the front end to the front end. And they even split it into different uh, chunks for JavaScript so that only the stuff that uh, you need on the client is currently loaded. So. Let's see how um, these different patterns worked. First, let's start with the single page application that was dominant in the in the 2000 years. So the single page application, usually the client requests, um, sends a request to the server. It gets back uh, stuff from the server. Then uh, a loading page is stone because um, nothing is yet loaded. So the stuff, the, the application has now go to back to the server, fetch data, uh, also run in the browser. So it needs some time to initialize the JavaScript and everything. And then when it's got, it gets back the data, the application is there and it's interactive. So you can already click on the, on the, on the items. So this uh, was the single page uh, mode. The problem with that is obviously that it's not very good for, um, for clients that have not a good internet connection probably because they have different uh, um, requests and responses also for really uh, slow clients, it's really bad because the whole application has to be built on the client. Yeah, there are other stuff, uh, especially in, around um, search engine optimization. So yeah, what ideas have, have, did the people have to make this better? One thing was the static site generation or server-side rendering. This is the stuff that PHP already did in the 90s or even C and Perl before. So the, the, the idea is, yeah, go to the server, the server sends back a page and the page includes everything and it's already rendered and everything is good. The problem is that that this is not interactive yet. So you can't click on anything and you don't get uh, the benefits of the JavaScript stuff. So you have to introduce something else. And these, this something else is usually called hydration. 
hydration, it's like the idea is like you have the plant on the server and you dry it out and then you send it over to the client and then you hydrate it again so that it can, can start growing again. Yeah, it works similar to the server-side rendering. So you, get, uh, you send a request to the server, server gets back with the full page. And then in the full page, um, uh, the JavaScript kicks in and re-renders the whole page adding all the event listeners to the to, to, to the application so that the application gets interactive. So the next thing would be interactive. But the step between not interactive and interactive can be a little bit uh, cumbersome. It can have some time. So you can have buttons where you can click on it, but it nothing happens because the hydration is not finished yet. If it's especially if it's a big React application, it can uh, lead to some problems. So what did people do? Yeah. They th thought about partial hydration, and this is the so-called islands pattern, which Astro, the framework, um, do, does a, a lot. So the idea is, yeah, do the same thing like hydration, but don't hydrate everything; just hydrate parts of the uh, of the page, and only probably if the user scrolls down, then hydrate this uh, element, or just hydrate the top most uh, important elements, and then later in the background task, hydrate all the, all the other stuff. So this is quite a good idea and works quite well. If you look at Astro, which is one of the frameworks, um, it, you see that the performance is really, really great for, for, for uh, web sites. Yeah, and uh, one of the newest patterns is called resumability. Um, and this resumability was introduced by a new framework called Quick, which I will talk about in, in, in the demo also, and uh, also lazy loading. The idea here is that you also do the server request. The server gets back with the page. The page is already there, but you don't do actually anything else. You just have a really, really, really tiny JavaScript that adds an, an event listener on the top of your page that reacts to every event. And as soon as you click on something or interact with it, you you activate this element. So you 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 you, you hydrate it on interaction, and uh, uh, Quick can do this because it sends all the data that is relevant for for this activating of the element in the HTML DOM with from the server to the client. It can also happen that uh, you can do lazy loading, so you can go over to another element, but the code for this element is not yet on the client. So as soon as you interact, the code is loaded from the from the server and uh, it gets to the client. So you can do this for stuff that's not very important, where nobody usually clicks on. Or you can even also uh, preload this in the background, and as soon as the user clicks on it, it will be right there. So um, this is also quite a good pattern because it lead, it, it saves a lot of bandwidth and, and, and performance on the client if the, if the JavaScript code doesn't have to be executed. So Quick's pattern is do not execute JavaScript code that's not needed. OK, that's the, the patterns that we saw. And uh, now let's look at the some of the frameworks that are available in this landscape. Interestingly, uh, or obviously, most of these frameworks are in the JavaScript area. So JavaScript, TypeScript, so Astro, Quick, Next.js, SwelteKit, Next, SolidJS. These are the, the most uh, known frameworks. Obviously, Next.js is uh, one of the um, most known frameworks in this area, but Next.js is kind of a little bit older. So the newer patterns are uh, only available in, in some of the other frameworks. We, have, we can have a look at that. But there are also other options. Uh, for example, Phoenix. Um, Phoenix is a framework uh, which is running on edX here on the Erlang VM. And Phoenix has something ca called Live View. And this Live View uh, is kind of emulates kind of the same, the same thing, where you uh, code everything in the backend in Alex here. And there's just a small JavaScript library that fetches all the stuff always from the backend, which is kind of interesting. And uh, an, another pattern that's, yeah, interestingly similar to these, but not really the same. And you can also nowadays use Rust, for example. You can use laptop, Laptos with Axum on the backend. And in this case, uh, you have server-side rendering in Rust. And then on the client side, it, the Rust is compiled to WebAssembly. And WebAssembly is used to generate the DOM again. So you have the same features like, uh, for example, here uh, on the left, like, like uh, uh, Next.js, but uh, with a Rust backend and frontend framework, which is also quite interesting. Um, the interesting thing about the Rust stuff is that is really, there's a lot of things going on there. So have a look at there as well. 
uh, today we're going to talk about the JavaScript frameworks mostly. So yeah, we'll, we'll see. Um, here I have a table. Um, I won't go into details. You can uh, have a look at it uh, afterwards in the slides. You see all the frameworks and which of these patterns these frameworks uh, support. Um, interestingly, um, here's Astro, for example, with this partial hydration and Yalens. And today I'm going to mostly talk about Quick, which is this one. It has also SSR, SSG, which is kind of all of them. And uh, Quick also has a thing called fine grained reactivity, which is also good for performance on the client, but uh, like SwellKit and SolidStart also have this, and it has this resumable feature. So yeah, we will look about that. And Quick is based uh, on something that looks similar to React, and it also supports React. So um, yeah, we 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 can see it uh, in the demo. Also quite interesting is when you look at uh, at uh, npm trends for these uh, frameworks. Um, you see, I, I just put in the NPM trends from, from Quick, SwellKit, Astral, Nuxt, and SolidStart. And you see Nuxt is um, one of the main things. It's Nuxt is in Vue.js. And you see the others are nearly irrelevant, so um, really small thing. SwellKit is uh, quite trending, and, yeah, and also Astral is also quite trending, but um, the other frameworks are really, really low. Um, when you put in Next.js, actually everything is really low. So Next.js is massive and it's kind of the industry standard. If you look at the so 4 million, I, I guess, I think it's weekly downloads. Um, so it's 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 a lot. Um, and the other frameworks are really, really low um, compared to, to Next.js. So if, you, if you're a big company and want to play it safe, go with Next.js. If you want to try something else, yeah, I, I would recommend uh, have a look at the others like Solid Start and and also Quick. So yeah, let's have a small demo how um, I, I built a small to-do app in Quick, including a backend, and see how how this works. So the to-do app will be like that. Uh, it will have a, a simple to-do list uh, which you can where you can add to-dos and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, here's the code. Um, you see uh, these frameworks, most of them work quite the same. They have kind of a source folder and inside the source folder, they have uh, routes and in this, uh, the routing is usually file-based. So uh, index.ts will be the index page. And if you have here like a folder like tests, uh, test and you put in a file index.ts in there, then slash test will uh, go to this folder like that. So. Uh, usually, these uh, systems also have kind of a layout system, so you can have a layout where you can yeah, put something around them, all the components. And here, uh, in 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 Quick, uh, there is a slot uh, item, and here in the slot, the, the the content will be put in there. Yeah, uh, when you look at this uh, application, you see um, it's it's kind of React, so it's JSX. Uh, it's written in JSX. What is interesting is that it uses forms, which you don't usually see in, in React. Um, you will see it in React with server components and stuff more and more. Also in the new Next.js version, they have kind of the same stuff. Um, you have a form and then you have an action that will be called when a to-do is added. So, And this interesting thing is this form is rendered on the, on the client, but this action, which is up here, um, is, is uh, created on, on the backend. So this stuff here, uh, which is in the same file just a little bit above runs on the back end and here i can add some to do service where i can uh, get uh, get added to do and then return a success so this is uh, quite interesting about these frameworks yeah so just uh, start it and see see how how it feels if we interact with the application so um, i'm gonna also pop up my dev tools here on the right and uh, you can that you can also see like uh, interactions here. Uh, what is quite interesting is um, that um, I can yeah, add to dos. And uh, interestingly, um, I, I just refresh the page again. You see that there's just nearly no JavaScript fetched in here. Um, but as soon as I start entering stuff here, you see that there's a lot of JavaScript fetched lazily afterwards. So that this is the lazy stuff that Quick does. Um, as soon as uh, I interact with something, um, it will reload the JavaScript that's needed for this interaction. Otherwise, it, it won't load it. So this is a, a, a quite interesting uh, feature of that. Also quite interesting is you can go in here and uh, deactivate JavaScript. Just disable the JavaScript. And now JavaScript is completely disabled on this page. I can refresh the page. It still renders. And I can even add a to-do 
click on enter and you can see uh, this was just a, no a normal form post now. So it was a full page refresh. So um, as soon as I deactivate JavaScript, um, everything works and there is nothing specially implemented on, on, on the framework on the back end. It's just this form handler, use add to do. It goes to the do service, adds to the do, and you don't even say render or something like that. It just works because the framework knows that when this form is submitted, uh, that it re will re-render the current page because there was no redirect or anything else. So uh, you just write it like you would write a single page application, kind of, and uh, you get the benefit of the application automatically be a server-side uh, rendered application that is fully working without any JavaScript. So this is quite interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. And I can go in here again and uh, enable JavaScript again. And yeah. And so I have everything here again. So this is quite cool. And if you think about a little bit about that, you can uh, build the whole application in a way that nothing um, actually needs uh, JavaScript on the client. And also the performance with that is really amazing. You get uh, pages that are automatically have a, a lighthouse score of 100. Um, and you don't have to think about it a lot. You write it in one code base, everything kind of works. Um, and it's quite easy to write and quite easy to handle for most web developers. OK, OK. Um, so this was uh, um, a small demo about how, how quick um, can can help you with that. Uh, the whole source code um, is um, located here on the GitHub. There are quick to do's. You can have a look at the code and play around with it, fork it, um, do whatever you like. Okay, so this was the first thing um, that I showed. But what also happened um, was um, we have something like the new edge hosting platforms, and this is also a big game changer that happened in the last. Um, couple of years. Um, we have different kind of ways to host code now uh, that is not a virtual machine because the first clouds only had the possibility to have a virtual machine and then you can put something on the virtual machine there, which didn't help you a lot with uh, with benefiting a cost. You can obviously put stuff there. Multiple uh, um, applications, again, like PHP and run everything there, but the hosting is complicated and you, you don't get auto scaling and all the benefits that uh, that new platforms like to have. So what happened? Yeah, a lot of, of things happened. We, we, we got function as a service on, on the one hand, um, Lambda or here with Azure, Azure Functions. And these um, function as a service uh, um, platforms provide you with this feature that you can just write the function, um, create everything, um, deploy it, and then you get automatically scaling to theoretically infinite instances. It, it scales down again to one instance. Um, and yeah, um, you pay only the usage. So you pay only the, the, the seconds that each function runs, uh, which can be really, really good for uh, applications that don't have massive uh, traffic. So if you have a small traffic application, function as a service is really, really cheap. If you have massive traffic, you can uh, still think about uh, deploying your own um, infrastructure like VMs or Kubernetes or whatever. Um, yeah, the other thing that happened in the in the last years is these edge workers uh, that we see on the right here. Um, Cloudflare was, I guess, the first one uh, that did this with Cloudflare workers. And these edge workers um, work like that. They are similar to function as a service, but they don't provide all the features that function as a service has but they run on every data center because with function as a service, you usually say, okay, this has to be run in West Europe or in, in US East or whatever. Um, with Cloudflare, you just deploy the function and it runs in, on all the 140 data centers or 200 whatever data centers that Cloudflare has. And it's, uh, so all the, 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 the request only goes to the local Cloudflare data center and the user has uh, a, a special, uh, Perf uh, very good performance locally. Uh, nowadays, also Netlify, Vercel, and a lot of others uh, ch jumped into the bandwagon. Also, there's also Lambda at Edge now, um, you know, which enables kind of the same stuff. Um, yeah, we will have a look how, how, how this works. And there's another quite interesting um, thing going on with Edge containers. So you can have now containers on the Edge. Uh, Fly.io is one of the most popular. I guess there are some others now, but I think Fly is still 
uh, the, the leader in that. So Fly does the same thing that Cloudflare does. It has massive data centers around the globe. And um, you can additionally, but you can cannot run only functions or like limited functions. You can run whole containers. So you can uh, run your whole application there, which gives you uh, special um, uh, special powers, especially with with um, libraries uh, like uh, Phoenix and Elixir, you can do a lot in in, in this area. Uh, today we're gonna focus on this edge workers and a little bit on function as a service. So yeah, the runtime comparison. What's the difference between function as a service and and these edge functions? Um, function as a service, um, yeah, you get a better isolation uh, usually because it uses micro VMs or containers. Um, in Edge function, you use V8 isolates. V8 is the Node.js runtime. It's a, the runtime, the JavaScript runtime that powers Ed, uh, the, the, the Edge and the Chrome browser, and also uh, Node.js, and also Atino and other runtimes. Um, and there is a special thing in there called isolates, where you can isolate code um, in, in, uh, in, in, and, and, and put it in kind of a, of, of a container. So this that's different, but it, it usually as a user you don't care about that. Um, yeah, the startup time is uh, interesting because uh, function as a service has this kind of cold start, uh, which uh, are not very good on Azure. It's a, a little better on AWS, and um, the, with these edge functions you don't actually have a cold start most of the time. So they're up in usually just a few milliseconds, um, uh, even if they weren't cold for a long time on in a data center. Um, that's because the, the V8 virtual machines are already running and they just run, load the JavaScript module and, and run it. So it's really, really fast. Um, functions as a service uh, have, has the benefit, obviously, that you can run any language. Um, most runtimes ex have explicit for support for JavaScript, Python, Java, .NET uh, in Azure and other languages. Um, with, usually you can also run any container so this also kind of works. With edge functions, you only have JavaScript and WebAssembly. So you don't have anything else uh, apart from that. So, um, uh, so you're very limited to that. And you don't even get a full Node.js uh, JavaScript. You, you get only a, a small subset of, of the, the Node.js runtime. So you don't have all the Node.js APIs available in, in this area. Yeah, with function service, you don't have any limitations in this case, but um for for other stuff but uh with edge functions you have a lot of limitations you have no tcp connections for example you can't create a tcp connection because these stuff will be turned off again as soon as they're uh, not there so you can't have a, uh, a persistent tcp connection with functions as a service you can do this because it starts the cold start and when it's running during the running phase you, you can have a tcp connection to a database or something like that which doesn't work with edge functions um, for example, if you're using Prisma to map your objects to the database, there's a special service in Prisma that maps kind of SQL to, to HTTP calls and then uh, uh, creates the TCP connection to the data, database, which kind of works. So it's like a proxy server for database connections. Yeah, you, you don't have uh, very much uh, handle, uh, you don't have a lot of bundle size. Usually it's quite limited per platform. And you have a small execution time limit, so just like 30 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, or something like that. With the functions as a service, you usually have longer a time to run. The cool thing about uh, these new frameworks is that uh, they can compile their application in a way that they run on these limited edge functions, and even uh, even uh, they they even create really small bundles, so um, you can even run it on, on most of these uh, edge functions. You can also run it on functions as a service, and this works quite well with this, um, these runtimes. Yeah, um, have a look at uh, two specific uh, um, hosting platforms, Cloudflare Pages and Azure Static Web Apps, which both support like the function plus static hosting, uh, which is really cool. Uh, the cool thing about Cloudflare is it's globally distributed. In Azure, it's only the static content is globally distributed, but the functions run in a defined region. Yeah, authentication uh, is really good at uh, with Azure uh, st static web apps. Um, with Cloudflare Pages, you have the zero trust, or you have to run your own authentication. Cold start is the other way around again. Cloudflare Pages is a lot better. Um, yeah, and static web apps add something to the request time if you have a cold start. CDN 
Cloudflare is fully integrated in Cloudflare Pages, obviously. Um, Azure SWA has uh, static web apps as front door, um, but you have to pay extra for that. Also, you have to pay extra for uh, Cloudflare Pages authentication. At the limits, currently, like server functions uh, in Cloudflare Pages have to be smaller than five megabytes, smaller than 20,000 files, 20 microseconds start time, 30 seconds execution. Yeah. And yeah, with Azure, you don't have a lot of limitations in this regard. Only the files uh, is a little bit smaller here. So yeah, let's have a look um, how you can deploy to that and also use the backend services from these two clouds um, to, to store data there. Um, it's also, uh, again, in the same um, application. There is the backend implementation, one backend implementation for Cloudflare and the other backend implementation for, for Azure Static Web Apps. And you can have a look at both of them. So yeah, as I said, there is um, um, we have backend uh, here, and I have a Azure backend, and the Azure backend uses the Azure data tables, which is part of the Azure storage account, and the um, the Cloudflare backend uses the Cloudflare, the new Cloudflare SQLite integ integration. So you can have a database there, but it has to be the Cloudflare database because it runs in this serverless special kind of environment. So you have this D1 database that's a distributed SQLite database, which kind of works quite cool. So let's have a look um, how this works. Um, let's close this one and first look at Cloudflare. So in Cloudflare, you have this Cloudflare pages, uh, which you can create a new project. You can um, then um, in the quick application put in an adapter for that. So um, what you actually do in, in quick, you just uh, run something like pmpm PM, quick add and pmpm PM, quick add. And then you get whole, the, the whole integrations. Uh, you get Netlify Edge, Versal Edge, Clouds Run. Uh, Google Cloud Run and so on and so on. And they also has Azure Static Web Apps and um, and also um, um, Cloudflare. So with that, uh, you can build the application for Cloudflare and uh, also deploy it to Cloudflare with a single command, which is quite nice. Um, and here you can see the application. You can see the deployments that were running. Um, the last deployment was running four hours ago. You can see the domain and so on and so forth. So let's have a look at the, at the website, how it looks. You can see there's the same to-do app. Now I have some tasks here. I can close them. I can add a new task. And the cool thing is uh, these, uh, these tasks are now stored in the, in the backend database here. So in the, under workers, you have this D1 database, which is still an alpha. Um, and there you can find your databases like to-dos. And when we look in here, we can see that we have four rows. So these are actually exactly the rows. So here I have to add new tasks that I just added. Uh, I can add another one, another one. And then as soon as I add another one and I will have a look at the table again, um, I will get another one um, here. So this database is uh, hosted Oh, there's another one. This database is uh, hosted in inside uh, Cloudflare and yeah, fully managed and everything works there. Yeah, let's go to Azure. Uh, same thing for Quick. You have an adapter for Azure. You can just edit, and then you have your Azure tasks here. Um, you can close them, and and it works the same way. Um, here you see the Azure portal. Portal. There is a static web app, um, and uh, you can also see there is the storage account. And when we go into the storage browser, we can see that there is a table storage to do's, and here are the tasks that we just saw here. So also the, the one completed that we just completed here. So <clears throat> you can use all the Azure services there, which is really, really cool. And you can also use the Azure Static Web App features like preview environments, where as soon as you create a, a pull request on on GitHub, for example, here, we have a new pull request on GitHub, QuickHub, which is updating Quick to the newest version. Then you get um, a preview link where you can also, in the static web app, deploy multiple instances. So this is the new version running on a different URL uh, with the newer Quick version. And yeah, you can preview that. And when you're happy with that, you can merge your, uh, 
your pull request there. So you can have these really cool features that are there. Um, and you can also have like everything else that's uh, that's here available, like uh, custom domains and also the security feature where you can have authentication um, and everything else. So this works really, really well here in Azure Static Web Ops. Uh, the only big problem with Azure Static Web Ops is that sometimes you have this cold starts and um, then the, the page needs like a half a second or a second or two seconds to load. Okie dokie. So yeah. That's really cool. And the cool thing about the quick framework is you don't have to do actually a lot of things. Everything, um, these adapters work out of the box and you can uh, deploy with them to Azure, to GitLab, to Netlify, Vercel, and, and so on and so forth. So, and all the other frameworks like Next.js and, 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 uh, and, and, and Swellkit and so on also have this kind of adapter feature where they, you can add uh, uh, adapters to deploy to other clouds. So this is pretty cool. And yeah, as you can see uh, with, with that, you can easily uh, host applications that are uh, easily developed, can have a lot of interactivity, work kind of like a single page application on the client, but uh, still uh, a backend application. And they work without JavaScript, they're searchable, they're indexable. And yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's really a, a good way to go away finally from our PHP applications and uh, use something new. Um, when we uh, look again at pricing, um, for example, the, when we looked at, at Cloudflare here, um, I have this Cloudflare free account. So this is actually costing nothing um, for me. Um, obviously you should, you should have a professional account, um, but they're also quite cheap um, for, for these use cases. I guess you, for a smaller site, you get around 20 euros a month. Um, and with Azure, um, you can have um, the Azure Static Web Apps uh, thing, which is also free. Also, the, the storage account is free for uh, for uh, some amount. And um, here in the uh, Azure Static Web Apps, you have like two plans: the free plan, um, and you have the standard plan, which is yeah around eight, to, yeah, so seven eight to eight euros in in this in this area. So this is quite good and and cheap to host. So yeah. I will suggest experiment with that and and go on with that. Okay, um, thanks so far. Um, I'm I'm finished uh, with my talk. Um, you can reach me out on this um, URLs. You also find the GitHub repository there. I will also put the slides on my homepage, derek.dev, um, for a later lookup. And also, um, yeah, we're, I'm working for Polish Informatic. We're hiring. Don't tell anyone. And yeah, just contact us and. Uh, Let's talk. So thank you very much for, oh, I think, um, yeah. Are there any questions? And I, I saw there's one question. Uh, the question was, does enabling enterprise grade edge improve the cold start situation on Azure? Um, I don't think so actually, because the cold start um, just uh, yeah, the, the, the enterprise edge stuff is uh, is kind of a front door that's put in front of your application, so the caching is better. But I think the cold start will still be there if your application is longer down. What you can do, you can uh, with um, with Azure Static Web Apps, you can deploy a custom function app. So you can deploy your own function app, and in this function app, you can uh, use one of the app service plans, not the not the not the plan that's uh, that is serverless, kind of some, but you you have to pay for for a, a certain amount for that it's running all the time. And then uh, this will get rid of the cold start times. But I'm talking about cheap stuff, so this will rule this one out. Any other questions? Okay, okay. Good, then have a good one. I will be in, um, um, in the Gata town uh, in, in the area two now. If you have any questions for me, um, yeah. And otherwise just ping me on one of the channels and yeah, hope to see you again. Have a nice global leisure and bye-bye.